Coming to you from the city of the weird. Exploring topics from the esoteric and unexplored to dimensions unknown. Shining a light of truth on the darkest corners of our reality. Welcome to the Curious Realm. Hello, hello. Chris Jordan coming at you here. Oh, whoa, I noticed I still have my conspiracy filters on. Here we go. Let me put my actual people glasses on. How you doing, everybody? So glad to be back here in the home studio. Uh, You may notice a little difference here tonight. We actually have a new camera system in-house. So uh, getting ready for a few hopeful in-studio interviews with some folks, things like that. So... Uh, hope you guys have been doing well over the last week. We uh, shortly after last week, last Wednesday, as a matter of fact, was the NASA UAP panel. Uh, the first panel of its kind where NASA has actively come out and said that they will be fully investigating UAPs. Um, there have been members of as NASA members and NASA scientists on panels previously. There's, of course, you know, uh, Travis, uh, Dr. Travis from uh, famously from Skinwalker Ranch, things like that, who is on who was part of um, the previous uh, investigation group before Arrow uh, came around and was also a NASA scientist and was one of those uh, that nobody really knew was actively looking into the field of UAPs. And now we have full-on Senate hearings every year. We have documents that are released along with the NDAA. Uh, We now have come to find out as of this panel officially that UAP is no longer unidentified aerial phenomenon. It is unidentified anomalous phenomenon. Um, and that is, that is interesting to hear now that it's the, uh, all domain anomaly resolution office that is in charge of, of course, everything arrow AARO. So we will be talking with Roy Schaffel, the head of MUFON San Antonio, uh, talking about MUFON, their collection methodology, uh, what they have been doing for years to categorize sightings things like that, a little bit of a response to some of these things um, from the NASA panel. And typically we would be going through the news of the week, things like that. But there there is literally I I went through I watched all four hours of this, folks, just so you are aware that this was a four hour open panel. The head of Arrow was there. He, He gave a fantastic presentation Um, I actually have to give uh, an applause and laud and tip of the hat to all of these guys, all of these scientists. There are two clips that I'm going to play at the beginning. Number one is the first question of the Q&A. And if, if, if anything, you need to watch the first hour of this and the last hour. Um, The last hour is where they are talking amongst each other about science, studying it, how to make sensors, what can we do, um, what can we do to intercooperate, what can we do to bring our global reach to this issue scientifically. And then questions, hard questions. I mean, they it was interesting to see them actively pull no punches with the questions that they presented to this panel of themselves. Um, like it was, it was interesting. And we'll hear some of that in the first question. But as, aside from that, what I want to address, uh, in, in the beginning of all of this is, um, literally the idea of threats, our society, things that we are involved in. Um, and it's, it's strange to to think that people have been wanting and craving this disclosure for as long as I can remember. 
Um, as long as I have known of the topic of UFOs, things like that, people have been crying disclosure, disclosure. And I am almost 50 years old. I'm 48. Um, so uh, to see people wanting the disclosure, to see disclosure starting to happen, this this crack in the facade literally opening up. Um, and, and you'll hear the head of Arrow talk about transparency in the quotes tonight, directly out of his own mouth talking about transparency of disclosure um and to know that these people are actively dealing with social media and active threats not only from social media but from certain groups emails things like that personal harassment for the fact that they're even on the panel um it's strange to ask scientists to literally do their job as scientists and then harass them for doing their job, people. I'm just saying, like, that's a that's a strange mentality. Um, but it exists, and it's out there. And it, it says nothing less about the confirmation bias of people um, than, than I think the actual confirmation bias of scientists not investigating the the 5% anomaly, which is the job of science. So we'll be getting into some of that. Uh, before we get Roy on, let's hear this first quote, which is actually one of the questions. Um, let's check out this first minute here of the public meeting. Another big question category was about transparency and about sharing information. And so examples in this category are, what is NASA hiding and where are you hiding it? How much has been shared publicly? Has NASA ever cut the live NASA TV feed away from something? Has NASA released all UAP evidence it has ever received? What about NASA astronauts? Do they have an NDA or clearance that does not allow them to speak about UAP sightings? I love the astronauts' response What are the science overlords there? hiding? No. Dan Evans. All right, I'll take a stab at that one. I really want to assure the public and to double down on some remarks I made this morning that this agency is absolutely cast iron committed to openness and transparency and honesty and that commitment also extends uh, to our live NASA TV feeds they provide real-time footage from our various missions now to my knowledge NASA has never intentionally cut a live feed to hide anything, and that includes UAPs, of course. Um, sometimes there are interruptions to our feeds, but that is simply because space is a complex place. There's a vast array of natural phenomena, human-made objects, and so forth. Um, but again, I wanted to reassure the public that we're absolutely committed to providing the public transparency and openness. Those are the hallmarks of NASA. That's why we're here today in public on TV because we want the public to have the opportunity to see the process of this committee doing its work in public. It's only right. And just to, to follow up on what I, what I said, I, I didn't mean to, be, to joke about it, but in my 20 years at NASA, no one, either officially or unofficially, in my recollection, have ever discussed or briefed us or had any kind of discussions about anything that would be considered a UAP or UFO or anything like that. And I'll ask you to stand for one second and state your name. I'll ask you to stand for one second and state your name just so everybody know okay. who was yeah. speaking. It's hard sorry, to see Scott in the back. Kelly. I'm just following up on what, uh, Once on again, the, the to, to hear the actual astronaut come out and say that, Roy, uh, uh, pretty incredible. Welcome back to the Roy, to the show. Roy Shelfall, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great this evening. Very pleased and thrilled to be asked back on your show. Um, it's a show that does explore darn near anything and with a certain amount of reverence and your reference uh, as a blend. I like that. So, Chris, thanks for having me again. Hey, thank you so much for coming back on. We had a great time having you on previously. I've enjoyed all of our conversation on air and off. Uh we were just talking previous to the show as we connected and got things ready here for the stream uh, regarding some of the stuff with the the recent NASA panel. I can understand how you can you can be upset as a representative of MUFON, one of the 
I would say one of the largest and longest running um, right up there with SETI when it comes to citizen science. Um, so knowing that MUFON has been out there categorizing things, um, I, I want to give you a chance real quick before we uh, get into the the next clip because the next clip that I want to play is is kind of the mentality clip that I was talking about and we talked about it a little bit last time um what do you deal with at MUFON because here in a minute we're going to get into a couple sensitive areas when it comes to evidence evidentiary processes um filtering and sieving evidence and what is evidence what is an evidence and a lot of people a lot of people get really, really gritty and salty, Roy, about MUFON not accepting their evidence. Um, <laughs> how often is it that you have dealt with something either email-wise or social media-wise that that you would consider to be a, a threat? Where someone's like, I'm going to um, do this because you you won't accept my evidence. Probably five to eight percent of the cases that I deal with, um, I, I do get that type of reaction. Wow! Um, I've never been I've never been threatened. Um, I've been I've had my parental ancestry questioned. I have had uh, <laughs> my sexual preferences questioned, and uh, you know, there's a long list of things. But those folks are in a very highly charged emotional state already. Yeah, and what they want is the answer that they want. I've had two particular cases uh, where I've had it handed over to someone else saying, "This, you know, this situation's out of control. I can't get it back into the middle." And um, it, it happens. People are emotional about this issue, and part of the reason is they're being told that what they believe is not the way they believe. Yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow. So I don't blame the people for reacting that way. I just wish we had, we as a ufologist had a better way to explain it to folks. Um, and if I may diverge for just a, a please, second. Please, please, go ahead. I was, we were speaking about cell phone cameras mm -hmm. uh, earlier. Cell phone ca uh, you know, cameras are a blessing to UFO studies and they are a curse. And, and while I have the, the soapbox here, folks, cell phones do not take photographs. Cell phones take replicates, and you have to dive very, very deeply into that to tease out the information. Uh, it's not a camera. It yeah. truly isn't a camera. Yeah. So a lot of times when we get photographs in and they are generated by a cell phone, I'm really happy and grateful to the person for submitting a sighting report. But at the same time, every now and then you have to break down the news like it was an insect. I couldn't have been, you know, the camera shows it miles away. No, you can run your trig on that. You can run all your math. You can analyze it all the way down to the type of phone used yeah. to take the photo. Well, and, and, but, and, you know, it's interesting because one of the clips that we're going to play later is the actual trigonometry where, where the, the NASA scientist lays down in three slides the actual math of the speed of the object in the quote go fast video the the famous video that everybody plays yep. over and over and over here's this object going this fast this far away and well like on the screen it's showing azimuth of the camera and like he's like literally every bit of juicy information that you would want to do the math to figure out the speed of this is literally right here on the camera so he starts laying it out, and it's like, and you'll see it in a bit, folks, but yeah, million-dollar platform, billion-dollar platform, the plane flying, and million, millions of dollars in training of an, an advanced pilot and some amazing technology that were both all absolutely fooled to the, to the point of it being one of the videos that led to the disclosure talks that led to Lou Elizondo, everything. Um, but by all trigonometry and math, and he's like, our job isn't to find out what the object is. Our job is to do the science. 
And the science and here is the speed of the object, and the known speed of the object on film is 40 miles an hour. <laughs> yep. It, it, you know, and part, part of a, a, a MUFON field investigator's training is that. Um, and you've got to go deep. It's not... When MUFON, when you analyze a case and you come up with your disposition, it's reviewed by someone else. Yeah. They review your data. And then it goes on further. And so there's two review processes of your information and your data. The good FIs, you know, there's good FIs, there's mediocre field investigators, and there's folks that, uh, you know, just enjoy doing it. Yeah. And the good FIs go very, very deep into all that photo analysis. I have four or five programs here uh, that I use to tease apart the information. Yeah. And, and people can be fooled. The eye can be fooled. Oh, absolutely. And very easily. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of magic shows out there and, that can, you know. And as proven, AI can be fooled. It's it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and get into this first clip real quick, because once again, I think this really opens up our conversation a little bit, Roy, about um, some of the things that are faced when dealing with the science of this and and when it comes to the science unfortunately people that can mean removing your own personal opinion from something it means removing your own religious belief from something it means removing your own passionate belief about something and having healthy and proper scientific skepticism where you're a willing to have your mind changed by the data presented and be willing to accept the data presented for what it is. And if Occam's razor is there and it's a simple logical solution, um, as shown with footage that Arrow investigates later where, hey, that's planes in flight path. And that fooled that like that made it all the way to our office, you know. Um, so let, let's go ahead and check out this first clip here. Note that several of them have been subjected to online abuse due to their decision to participate on this panel. And NASA's security team is actively addressing this issue. We at NASA are acutely aware of the considerable public interest in UAP. However, it's critical to understand that any form of harassment towards our panelists only serves to detract from the scientific process, which requires an environment of respect and openness. Now, every member of our team is a recognized authority in their respective field, and they have our unequivocal support. NASA stands in solidarity with them, advocating for a respectful discourse that befits their expertise and the significance of their work. Thanks. Now, in recent years, the subject of unidentified aerial phenomena, nowadays termed unidentified anomalous phenomena, or UAPs, has captured the attention of the public, the scientific community, and the government alike. And it's now our collective responsibility to investigate these occurrences with the rigorous scientific scrutiny that they deserve. NASA Administrator Senator Bill Nelson believes that understanding UAPs is vital for several reasons, which is why he directed this study. First and foremost, it provides an opportunity for us to expand our understanding of the world around us. As an organization dedicated to exploring it, the unknown, it's interesting, uh, once again, to hear him finally say, and to hear scientists finally say, to as, as people who are dedicated to exploring the unknown, like, that is what science is. It's it's not about continually proving the same thing over and over again. Um, and continually, it's it's about the exploration, the, the unknown part. Uh, and to hear, hear NASA finally kind of stepping up to the plate I guess Roy is is nice. Uh, I think for a long time, um, as that first question holds, uh, the one that we started off the show with, um, people I think have stood behind a mystical curtain for a long time, thinking that there is an iron wall of hidden things behind that curtain. Um, when really, and, really, and there's no. Yeah, and, and it's time to pull that curtain open. Yeah. Um, part of the part of the problem is that you've got folks that they're not being, you know, what they say is completely true, but it may not be truly complete. 
and sure. normal civilian civilians or civ- you know uh, civilian scientists, as, as I will call them, MUFON field investigators or citizen science scientists, you know we want to know, truly want to know. We're we're big big people. We're grown adults. We can handle the truth. Well, but and the way everything yeah everything's been handled in the past, it, it led to a lot of suspicion. Um, a lot of government conspiracies. Yep. And all, all they had to do was tell us the truth. Yeah. The complete truth. Well, well, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, not a lot of people are aware that um, the majority of STS missions were had some sort of classification to them. They were going up to repair a national reconnaissance satellite or to launch one. Or um, a lot of times, they didn't even get their instructions for their mission mission until they were actually in orbit. Um, and, and that the was... The payload a, was in the, bay, in the bay. That was a great and majority of flights. Um, yeah. But when you consider where funding from that comes from and where their research goes to help uh, when it comes to launching things into orbit for the Air Force, even at Vandenberg, stuff like that outside of the shuttle, outside of those platforms... Um, NASA plays a huge, huge part in that, and and always has. Uh, so, yeah, I and mean, they will continue to. Yeah, yeah, precisely. And um, now, now, does that necessarily mean that they are the great dad, data gatherer of the the unknown and unexplored? No, no. And and that's one of the things that they kind of get into a couple of times. Um, they were talking about. How, uh, you know, a, a big part of science is, yes, exploring the unexplored and how a lot of that comes along anonym, uh, anomalously in science. How even fast radio bursts, which just won a major physics award, um, the discovery of them was a total accident. They were looking for something yep. else and the instruments happened to be so sensitive that they started picking up these random bursts. Um. But then they told another story about how, well, once they started looking into them, um, they found this strange conglomeration of them up around lunchtime, uh, up around this one point of the day that that they would just spike in this one region of of the sensors. And what it actively was, was the scientists a few walls over in the lunchroom opening the microwave before the ding. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, but it took them finding the anomaly within the anomaly. <laughs> like they were and, investigating and, an anomaly that was happening on their sensors to begin with, which is how they found fast radio bursts because they were like, what the heck is this anomaly in the research that we're trying to find? which led to other research. And then while they were researching that, this other anomaly pops up that ends up just being the dudes like microwaving a sandwich <laughs> two offices over. Yep. <laughs> so well, many, many of your, many of your great scientific discoveries mm. other than nuke, nuking a sandwich have been pretty big mistakes. Uh, good oh, yeah. vulcanization of rubber. Yep. Uh, Teflon. Teflon was something that happened uh, in a laboratory, uh, and a few years later, they they opened the gas cylinder and found this greasy stuff. It was Teflon. They couldn't wash it off, and so all these things uh, that we go back in time and take a look at, they're all somewhat anomalous. They weren't planned. Uh, they happened, but it took some time to go back and find out, as you said, why it happened. What's there? What's the causation? And you know, the micro, the fast um, radio, uh, f- fast burst is, is an example of that also. So while we plan and do research, and I, I spent a huge part of my career in research and development, um, deep research and development for various organizations, including NASA, way back when. Mm. And yeah, you were a material scientist, correct? Yes, that is correct. Chemist, actually, and worked on, uh, you know, like the SRBs for the space shuttle and a variety of other things that I had my hand in. But it, it was one of those deals where your mistakes really uh, lead you to greater discoveries. And and by them trying to track down what happened with those bursts, 
that's that's amazing because you have to take that approach. And very honestly, that is what MUFON teaches you: how to approach it, how to analyze it, and whatnot. Yeah. And at this at this stage of the game, MUFON has a hundred and I'm going to call it 131,000 sighting reports. That's a big database. Unfortunately, it's not being taken into consideration, yeah. uh, to my knowledge, of, of this new panel. The new panel, blue ribbon, absolutely blue ribbon. And it's not a hit panel. Many years ago, 55 years ago, the Condon Project, Condon Committee from Colorado University, yeah. uh, really did a hit, hit job on UFOs. Um, and it was funny because they found memos two years before the conclusions were drawn, written by committee members that said, hey, none of this is ever going to get out in, into the public. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. Colorado University is going to look good. We're going to dismiss all this no matter what it says. Literally, yeah, a member yeah. from one of the committee members. Low, Low was the committee member, L-O-W. But that type of cause for skepticism on a part of someone like MUFON is, is inbred now, unfortunately, because... The, the trust has been ruined. Trust was well, ruined many, many years ago. My wife was literally telling me, and I cannot remember for the life of me which show it was. She listens to quite a few podcasts. Imagine that. She hosts one, too. Um, love you, sweetheart. Uh, she she was telling me about one today where, because she was listening to part of this in the background and preparing her lunch, and we started talking, and she was like, I was actively listening to this this scientist who was on a on a show I was listening to that said he was brought into a health care panel uh, with with the sitting president, not with the sitting president, but, you know, like commissioned by the White House to to study this topic. Um, but they they wanted no results that would confirm this topic. It was like the That's, panel itself and the study itself was just basically a political hit piece to say we're putting together a study on it. Um, and, and, and in today's world, that, that's common practice. Yeah, yeah. And to to think about that and to think about that in terms of science, to think about that in terms of anything, it's like, wow, wow. And, and even in the right of studies that the numbers are particularly manipulated and specifically manipulated uh, to achieve the desired result. Um, that is that is another rampant issue in science is people manipulating their result to get their achieve, desired achieved result, um, which unfortunately is not science. It may confirm theory. It may confirmed teaching or modern concept, but that doesn't mean it's correct. That, that is true. And they've got to give the results that the person paying for the research yeah. wants, or they don't get funded again. Yeah. That's the downfall of our system. Yes. You've got to produce results favorable to who's supplying the money. I, I, I always go back to uh, the movie Jerry Maguire with Cuba Gooding. Mm. Show me the Show money. Me the money. Show me the money. And and, and, it's and I have a good friend who always tells me, he said, hey, you know, I'll tell that guy the truth four or five different ways before I lie to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a hell of that's a right. comment. That's right. You know? <laughs> and so, um, but, with that in mind, the, the next clip I have is actually from Nikki Fox talking about quality of data, <laughs> issues with quality of data, things like that. Let's hear what she says, and we can kind of respond to that in regards to MUFON and what you guys do, um, all that kind of stuff. Aircraft, military equipment, the weather, and ionospheric phenomena like auroras. This lack of high quality data make it impossible to draw scientific conclusions on the nature of UAP. Now, this team has used unclassified data from civilian government entities, commercial data, and data from other sources to inform uh, their recommendations. And as Dan noted, they will be published in a public report that comes out this summer. I want to emphasize that there is really great benefit to studying unclassified data rather than classified data for this study. 
First, unidentified anomalous phenomena sightings themselves are not classified. It's often the sensor platform that is classified. And you can kind of think of it, um, if a fighter jet took a pic picture of the Statue of Liberty, then that image would be classified, not because of the subject in the picture, but because of the sensors on the plane. Second, unclassified data make it possible for our team to communicate openly to advance our understanding of UAP, not only with each other, but across the scientific community and to the public. This ensures a clear and transparent pipeline of information that can be built upon through, the gener through generations to expand our understanding. This study relies on open data. Everything we use at NASA is open and anyone can look at these records. So I invite you to visit our open data portal at data.nasa.gov to comb through our tens of thousands of data sets that are free and fully accessible to the public. Additionally, please check out data.gov slash open slash. Not a lot of people realize that NASA does make all of their research public. Everything. Um, it's all available. It's all there. Pictures, high res images, everything. Um, that it is. That it is. Um, MUFON again uh, has attempted to work with the government. The government is more willing to work with MUFON now more than it ever has. Our um, executive director David McDonald has, has made a concerted effort to work with the government, but you do have a, there is a habit of the um, Washington or governmental elitists mm. because MUFON is a group of citizen scientists. Yeah. Um, many of them non-degree, and that, that's a big thing uh, with the government. You have to have your degrees in line. Well, yeah. that, that would have sort of eliminated Ben Franklin, and Thomas Edison, as it eliminated Chuck Yeager from the, uh, from the space program. He didn't have a degree, but he was the world's greatest test pilot for a full decade. So there is a little bit of elitism that does go along with this. Um, and, and I look at that very harshly uh, because many of the most intelligent people I knew were not degreed. And quite frankly, only 23 to 25% of the American public yeah. possesses a degree. So there is a little bit of elitism going on, but I will tell you, MUFON has made every effort to reach out, to assist, to open our books, which are already open to a large extent. Yeah. Um, w with the exception, we protect. Whoever hands us a report, they are protected. Um, their, their name is never given out. Their contact information yeah. never given out. And so we do all that, but they haven't availed themselves of all that information. 130,000 to 131,000 cases, that's pretty dang stout information. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of cumulative knowledge. And and uh, once again, going back close to 50 years um, on the topic and to to know uh, the clip I'm about to play is actually about data collection, things like that. And I think that um, anything I would say would actually be pretty, pretty close to in response to this as far as MUFON's data collection um and how they do it it's it's fantastic it's amazing let's hear let's hear real quick um about the the current collection of data and um unsystematic collection of data across agencies because that that has been a real issue when it comes to this topic um and something that i think that mufon has fully addressed uncalibrated for yes, they data have. collection and if I think about the data that people have out there, it's in many ways what we'd like to think of as citizen science. But again, it is uncalibrated data, um, poorly characterized, not well curated. And we face, looking through this data, a significant background, a background of many of these events are commercial aircraft, civilian and military drones, weather and research balloons, military equipment, ionospheric phenomenon. We need to characterize how, when the, date, when the date is taken, when it sees events like this first. Now, that that was one of the clips that, 
fully felt where he was coming from. If you're talking, and that's part of what we were saying in our pre-conversation, that was the exact question, the exact statement that I was like, it got my blood boiling him for a minute. Because if you're referring to MUFON, I I beg to differ. This thing's two fingers thick. Yeah. This is the field investigators manual, folks, from last year. Like this is the latest version, as far as I know. Um, and this this is what fifty years of field investigation has begotten a methodology for at least taking a witness report properly. How to how to treat evidence in the field what kind of things to look for now granted once again if you're talking civilian and military agencies alphabet agencies sheriff's departments police departments emts 911 things like that yeah uh military reporting faa reporting all stabs in the dark they are trying to take in a report and good god can we just get back to business real quick you know um so you're you're 100 correct their their eye for scrutiny was never really there to begin with as far as investigation or taking the report so to have a methodology of reporting where it was unified like hey sheriffs guess what here's the arrow form there it is fill it out oh hey coast guard you saw something here's the arrow form fill it out where everybody is filling out the same thing, um, you guys kind of pregenerated that concept a long, long time ago, um, which is why I love seeing the fact that a lot of the original questions that were asked at the first congressional panel um, came from MUFON cases, came from MUFON questions. We are very structured in our approach to field investigation. We have been taught and tutored all the way through how to take samples, how to bag up samples, how mm. to label samples. It's as thorough as any program out there. Um, it is the best program. And I'm coming from a research background saying this is the way to do it. Now, what does occur, we don't have the equipment that the government does, but I, I do want to come back to the, the gentleman's statement. The one thing he did say, he did not call out MUFON. No in that regard. What he did call out was all the other governmental agencies as not having consistency in their reporting. Yes. And for that I was happy. And and um, citizen science. And, and yes. that that that's where it was I, I don't think it was a full on dig against MUFON, but it was it was definitely right there near the tip of the sword. <laughs> Um, it was, and it yes, was a finger I, poke. It was a finger poke. I, I will. I will definitely not. Uh, I. I will never deny that. Yeah. Like I'm. I'm sorry. I mean, we had the conversation last time about breaking people's hearts on social media and in other groups and things like that when presented with pictures and images and videos because uh, that's all I've done for the better half of my life is edit audio and video and restore pictures, things like that. So, yeah, I can spot anomalies and, pretty quick. Um, yeah, and, 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 and we have the computer programs to do that today. Yeah. And you get in there and, you know, I, I will share one case with you. Please. The case came in and it, the lady said, okay, yeah, the, the windshield's got all this mud on it, but take a look at this. We were traveling at this time of the day going this way, blah, blah, blah. And this thing came up and you know, it's UFO and okay. I'm looking at the photos. I'm looking at her timeline. I'm looking at the highway where she's traveling and where she's saying this, this thing came up. Well, the direction of the highway does not even come close to the direction she said they were traveling in. It happened to be the planet Venus just to, you know, make a long story bearable. But mm. all of her information was absolutely incorrect. Now, is that a, a file in MUFON now? Yeah, it's a file in MUFON. And my disposition was not a UFO, Yeah, you know, inconsistent reporting. So that's what we do. We look at everything. Now, do we have scientific measurements that can measure the width of a hair on a gnat's left forward arm? No, we don't. <clears throat> Ours are normally quick case, cases. A sighting might last... 15, 30 seconds. Yeah. I wish this new group well 
in developing all these testing procedures that they will have the exact instruments at the exact place for that 15 to 30 second window where they can measure everything that they want to. Well, Good luck with that. Well, and that was that was one of the many, many things that was brought up was the fact of if anybody has the instrumentation, <laughs> we do. Um, and and we'll get into the we'll get into the clip from the arrowhead in just a minute where where he talks about the instrumentation and and having his fingertips at the at the disposal of the best instrumentation in the world, but he can't use it constitutionally. He can't point it in he can't point it in your backyard and, and see what was there. You know, or what pops up every Tuesday, but a NOAA satellite could. So if a NOAA and satellite knows the known quantitives of, hey, can your stuff see into the X-ray band? Can it detect X-ray band? Because here's the bandwidth of the anomalies that we're looking for. So just add this to your data set of your sensors. And now if we get a report, all you have to do is go back through your data over Detroit where you were already gathering weather data. Exactly. There, there's really no excuse for them not to have the data at this point. Yeah. Except they haven't cultivated their machines, their instruments. Yeah. To look for these things. And and there's that's such a bias against it. That that's what was really really interesting to literally see happening within this four hour panel. Not only from Arrow, the the alpha, the new Alphabet agency that's in charge of all this, um, but to see that attitude from NASA and from the scientists of like we have these capabilities like the if if we're complaining about you know sensors and and data and things like that um well let's put the proper sensors on it and that that actually brings me up to our next clip um which is from the same gentleman talking about uh imperfect data and the challenges of imperfect data and what what we were talking about earlier with cell phones and the issues with cell phones and considering that as a full on quote data set. Uh, so let's hear that real quick and then we can respond to that, Roy. And you have also commented that data are not always perfect when we're doing certain studies. I wonder if you could um, shed some light on the you know, the difference between the application of certain data to certain scientific challenges. So, you know, when you look at your camera, your camera is often designed to take an image in the daytime and might not be optimized for nighttime imaging. Or if you take something that uh, astronomers are very familiar with is we design our telescopes to work at night. And if the sun is n not even, if you, can, you know, you would never take the Hubble telescope and point it at the sun. This would destroy its detectors. Not only that, if the telescope is pointing there and the sun is over there, even though you're not looking at the sun, reflections off of the optics will produce what we call ghosting. And that kind of ghosting Gets, produces some very strange images. And this, you know, one of the many things we need to worry about when we see unusual things taken from a camera is even if you're pointing the camera there, was the sun over there? Those kinds of anomalies degrade the quality of the data. And that's why it's very important to work with well characterized instruments. And to be, you know, using them in ways in which you you understand what what's going on. So I think if you look at and that Roy, of course, is one of the things that we were literally just talking about. The idea of, um, unfortunately, not that we don't have great technology in our pocket. I mean, hey, I'm I I was a Kodak disc kid, you know. Um, it, it it was amazing how small it got and how thing how crazy things have gotten. Don't get me wrong. However, is what we have in our pocket uh, a scientific instrument enough 
to get anything other than a size relation, a general direction. And and like they said, that that data is still usable. Like, don't not take a video of it because it, it's just a replication. As you were saying a minute ago, it's not an actual picture. Even though it's a bunch of things strung together and it's a video and it's in 4K, doesn't mean that the resolution is the same as you know, a a 4K full-on broadcast video camera or a 35 millimeter strip of film. Um, Because there's there's more pixels in a 35 millimeter strip of film than there is in 4K. Um, So it's, it's remarkable to think what's in our pocket, but to consider it a precision instrument, not quite. To consider it a no, scientific you're... instrument, not no, not at all. No, it's it's what I call an, an indicator. Um, that's about all it is is an yeah. indicator of something occurring. And you know, and I'm glad we we played that last clip because one of the things we are trained in, and most people don't know this, but we have a thing called the third Thursday. Hmm. And that's for all the field investigators from MUFON, Texas, uh, get together on the third Thursday, and we have a training course in something. Epic. So our training is constant year long, year long. So, you know, called uh, normally 11 months a year. Yeah. And these are so many issues we get to. And very honestly, I've had cases where they have said they've been, let, you know, here it is, it's a UFO. Well, you're in the car, you're traveling 80 miles an hour. Uh, the sun's starting to set, and, and you're facing it, and you take the shot through your windshield. I can tell you it's probably going to be ghosting. It still requires us yeah. as dedicated investigators to investigate it, yeah. but it normally is a ghosting or flare phenomenon. Mo- m- like and- most things on a ring camera, unfortunately, especially at night, uh, because you're talking about a parabolic lens. You're talking yeah. about a, a, a yeah. 180 degree lens. Um, you get a lot of ghosting out of that. You get a lot of aberrations and a lot of strange things. And, you know, like even a prime example, like, yeah, you could go online. I'm, I'm holding an actual functional, you know, Geiger counter in my hand right now. It's, it's one of the classic ones that you see from like a, 1970s movie, you know, big yellow box with a with a big old voltmeter up top for the rotogens. Um, yep. Or you could go get you a lab grade Geiger counter that is precision. And it, hey, this is definitely going to give you a reading. Don't get me wrong; it's going to let you know pretty decently. But you want to get down to decimals. Uh, you need something that is precision and and that's a different yes. instrumentation and when you're talking evidence and proof um my my question is uh your court case now for your freedom depends on the precision of the instrument used which one do you want me to use the yellow box or the precision geiger counter you know um, I could come with the yellow box, but is that the evidence that you want to convict you? <laughs> yeah, it's you know, and, and it's true. And 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 all field investigators, MUFON provides no funds for their field investigators. It's all out of our yeah. own pockets, and we buy what we can. Um, fortunately, uh, I've got access to some higher grade analytical machines than, than other people do, and. Uh, you know, I, I always get a, a kick out of watching some of the paranormal shows, uh, especially when they're looking for electromagnetic pulses or whatever the hell they're looking for. And, you know, their little tri meter, you, yeah. you know, flicks back and forth a few times. Well, you know, it happens to be an electrical wire in that wall, and it's grounded to that pipe that you're standing next to. So, you know, yeah. these are the things as investigators we look for. Yeah, inductive and, and fields. Our, our, Exactly, exactly. Or someone who opens the microwave up uh, on the other side of the wall when you're in the dining room looking for something. And, uh, yeah, it, it's a tough call. 
I, I would hope that the, and, and I do use the term elitist in Washington. I spend a lot of time there. Oh, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Sometime. And, and uh, they do have an attitude about them, and they all are very, very highly educated, uh, well-pedigreed, well-degreed, uh, and they have a habit of looking down. And what they should be looking at for us is accept our data for what it is. It's not perfect. No data is yeah. perfect. Yeah. And and that's that's one of the things that came across. They want a hundred percent sure, absolute one hundred percent surety on all this stuff. They're not going to get it. Well, and um, and, and that's they're... just it. Um, you can't get a hundred percent surety on all of it. And uh, once again, the 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 thing that I said privately that I say on air all the time is I, I challenge you to find another group where things are more categorized, more organized, and where things have followed the same process for as long as MUFON. Um, you ain't going to find it. If you're looking for at least no. a set of datum that you can add to your larger set of, of data, you know, uh, that that would be the one that you would immediately want, I would think, because at least then, um, as far as witness statements go, you've you've got a lockdown. Um, this was taken in the same way all the time, every time. Now, granted, a lot of the cases with Arrow, who we're about to hear from right now, uh, since they started, when they started, they had six hundred fifty cases. Now. They're up to 800. Yep. 800 cases. And out of that, as as they said in a later clip, um, I don't know if we'll get to it or not, Roy, but um, 2 to 5 percent. To, and that's the number I typically use is, you know, about 5 percent. Hey, once again, if I hired a dude to build a wall and came in and found 95 percent of a wall, I'd have questions. And and once again, to hear these scientists from NASA say we're our job is the five percent. At least now we know what to look for, you know, Um, and that's just it. And something that we've brought up before, something that I bring up regularly when investigating anything paranormal is that you've got to get rid of the norm and just leave the para. You've got to figure out exactly what you're investigating and what the methodology for investigating that is. And and oh, I think... Chris, if I, go ahead. If I, could, if I can jump in for just a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, please. That is the one thing that, that, that really impressed me about MUFON. Um, I've been interested Same. in UFOs since the late 60s. But the impressive part about MUFON is not just the training, but it is the structure they apply. They apply. Every case has the same forms. Every case is submitted to us. We have data that we have got to input into that. And most of it's required field data. And we have 30 different forms um, that we use for each and every particular incident. Um, and having done all this research and when I published papers, all that silly stuff, or anyone who wants to, you know, Google me, Google me and see what I've written about a lot of things, but it was the structure of MUFON and the very scientific approach for citizen scientists to, to go beyond just being, Hey, look, that's a pretty light in the sky. That's a UFO. No, that's not what we do. We are thoroughly trained. Yeah. Hours and hours of training and that damned exam is a four hour exam to become a field investigator. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to do five five cases under under some mentoring or tutelage, um, and they analyze your cases. You know, can you make the cut or not? Some people don't make the cut. Some people do. Yeah, I was one of the fortunate ones from my technical background, but it is rigorous. Uh, it is more rigorous than any other uh, UFO investigative agency out there. And I would match our guys up against that group in Washington any day of the week. Yeah, yeah. That's that first statement. Yeah, I, I would, I would tend to agree, and uh, you know, really, um, once again, I, I think that their job, and we'll we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Sean Kilpatrick, who's the actual head of Arrow here in just a second. 
um, from his own words exactly what their charge is. And yeah, their their charge is to investigate what they're given and to come up with a unified means of reporting. Because once again, citizen science wise, you guys at MUFON have had a unified means of eyewitness statement intake for almost 50 years. Um, that is correct. And and that in and of itself is a huge data set. That is a massive, massive, da- massive data set to be able to comb through and, and to just have. Um, and I think that things like that especially help narrow down some of what he talks about in his presentation where he shows the phenomenology slide. And in the middle, it's it's showing things like shapes. Stuff like that, like uh, on the side, it's got a big Venn diagram of shapes and showing that spheres are 47 percent of all of them that have come to them. Um, and and I think that MUFON has done a lot of things like that that are amazing where where they have been able to chronicle that kind of stuff and and really get those details down um, as far as how to call that information together, how to bring it together as a as whether or not you consider it as as the NASA scientists put it a calibrated data set um yeah it it's once again a massive data set that you cannot ignore you it it would it would be a disservice to the 5% that you're investigating to not investigate even the, a small slice of the 50 years of data from MUFON, um, which I'm sure Arrow has contacted MUFON and been in touch uh, at, and at some before point. Before we go to the tape, please. Before we go to the tape, every month we receive several reports from MUFON headquarters mm. with the classifications as follows one, reports by country, sightings by country, number two, sightings by state, and um, you know, Texas is included still as part of the 50 states. But uh, with, with that said, we also receive reports on, you know, estimated sizes, uh, obviously non-calibrated, to quote the gentleman. Um, but we receive shape reports mm, and, yeah. you know, different shapes, you know, the triangles, uh, you know, the spheres, the saucers, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we get very detailed reports as indicators and, and that's what they are. These are things people who have reported yep. that our caseload is telling us. These are what people have seen and sometimes photographed. So I did want to say that before we went to the aero tape. Oh, and absolutely. By the way, thanks for putting on these tapes. Thanks for putting all these tapes together tonight. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No, most definitely. Like uh, Things like this, I actively go through and either screen capture or download, Roy. Um, and I've got an archive of four hour things like this, uh, just in case they ever happen to disappear off public services, you know, um, you never, you never know when a Google channel just disappears or content from one just gets buried. Uh, so yeah, I, I make it pretty easy to, to keep it in perpetuity. I just... I snatch it off the internet and keep a copy on a a non-local hard drive. So, yeah, <laughs> that is what your, your we're. Efforts are appreciated. It's. I mean, we're playing directly off YouTube tonight, but um, yeah, that's that's typically what I do. So that if I need to make a a highlights reel or something like that for a later interview, um, it's all there. But I I went through. I watched probably about the first two and a half hours of it um, a couple days after it came out and then I was like okay you know my my kids movies done I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in the next room and check on that and everything and um, then sat today and watched the entire four hours of it um, and rewound some of it and took notes and listened again and listened again and like made sure I heard that dude right. Okay, catching this new lingo of um, anomaly instead of uh, of 
like you know it's it's interesting to see the language changing and stuff like that so um let's let's go ahead and speaking of language changing let's let's hear from the director of arrow himself dr sean kilpatrick about the transparency of disclosure that arrow was trying to bring about and i thought it was a really interesting uh language that he used there but let's let's hear it from the man himself, Dr. Sean Kilpatrick. Linkages. NASA also has access to Earth sensing satellites, radiological sensors, tools for gravitational wave, geomagnetic wave detection, and means for analyzing open source and crowdsourced data that may assist both Aero and NASA in their UAP efforts. We are very grateful for the partnership and welcome the opportunity to join with NASA to share our collective findings with the public as the U.S. government moves towards greater transparency on this issue. Last month, I testified before members of the Senate Armed Services Committee on emerging threats and capabilities and shared some of the progress made since Arrow's establishment in July 2022. I discussed Arrow's scientific and analytic approaches, its efforts to improve UAP data collection, standardize our reporting processes, leverage our partnerships, and meticulously review the U.S. government's UAP-related historical records. As I told the subcommittee then, the resolution of all UAP cases cannot be accomplished by DOD and the intelligence community alone. ERA's ultimate success will require partnerships with the interagency, industry, academia, the scientific community, and the public which all bring their own resources, ideas, and expertise to the UAP challenge. We believe robust collaboration and peer review across a broad range of partners will promote greater objectivity and transparency in the study of UAP. Of course, NASA's UAP independent study team was convened very much in that spirit. I also emphasize to Congress that the only a very small percentage of UAP reports display signatures that could reasonably be described as anomalous. The majority of unidentified objects reported to Arrow and in our holdings demonstrate mundane characteristics of readily explainable sources. Which number of cases- is also the case with, of course, most MUFON cases. Um, you're, to, you're correct on that. To the sadness of many people, once again, I mean, it's it's not that we are believers, not that they are believers, not that, I mean, there's a, as they point out later, there's an exobiologist on here. I mean, are they talking about people with people with brains traveling across the universe? No, but they're talking about other life forms, you know, tardigrades, things like that, that live on other planets, that kind of stuff. Um, what are we doing to affect them by being out there? All that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. To to see the once again the open dialogue going on uh, is fantastic, and to see it being done in a public forum is is awesome. And and, and I'm I am exceedingly happy for this because they have approached it very differently than they did in the 1960s mm. or even the 1980s. Yeah, Um, it's much more open and and that's where some of the cell phones have done good they've raised the awareness yes Uh, the cell phone uh, replicate photos yeah it it has raised awareness that what is going on and there's roughly I want to say 60% of the people now based on polling okay um, polling is hit or miss as we both know but there's a huge population out there now it says, okay, we want to know what the hell is going on. Not that we believe it's, you know, uh, war of the worlds type of thing. It's we want to know. We're yep. big people. We're mature adults, and we want to know. And I think that's the beauty of everything that's going on right now. Um, the the perception of MUFON has changed greatly over the last five six years. Mm. They no they no longer look at us as the folks, and I'm going to date myself here, that wear the tin foil hats. Yeah. Um, or the aluminum hats. And, you know, we're more widely respected. And there's some conversations I've gotten into in different arenas, different social groups, 
And somebody said, well, Roy, don't, don't you investigate you know, flying saucers? Well, not quite, but here's what I do do. Yeah. And there's a greater acceptance. No one's smirking at you or pointing fingers or calling you a wacko. So the entire perception of this whole field, for lack of a better word, ufology, has changed over the last five to six years to a very positive image. Whereas before it was the purview of the, you know, not, not so cool people. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, the, as they put in the panel themselves, the, the fringe. Um, and, and that was something that I, I was very, very proud to see. One of the scientists own the fact of studying a 5% anomaly is not fringe. That's what we do. Yep. That's science. That's not fringe science. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And we make the point all the time, once again, of the, the incomplete wall. And I don't know of a chemistry professor that would let you pass with a 95% accounting of what happened in in that chemical reaction. What happened to the 5% no. remainder? I, I don't know. Is it gas? Is it solid? Is it residue? I don't know. You know? Just blow up? Yeah. The, you know, the, the, yeah. And, the, and, and the, the rigor, the scientific rigor has got to go into this. Yeah. To truly answer the question. Well, and um, that, the government has the money and the equipment to do it. Yes. And and that is exactly what, what they were bringing up with this panel is the fact of we now have the charge to do it. You know, before, yes, somebody may have considered it fringe. It's not anymore. Um, and us investigating it will will bring about more international collaboration the way that any NASA project works. Um, one of the scientists even posed later on in the Q&A where they were talking amongst themselves um, that there should be a NASA office akin to Arrow. That that's all they study. A hundred percent. And I was like, that's yeah. that's fantastic. He's like, doesn't have to be big, four or five people, whatever, but we we should have a dedicated team of people that that is what they're doing is studying this. Um because yeah, there there is a five percent anomaly out there that whether you want to consider it a national security threat, what have you, um it's real. It's there. It is phenomenologically provable. And they don't know what it is. No, um, they don't. And many, many countries have moved ahead of us in this investigative field. Oh, yeah. Uh, Italy, Italy, um, some of the South American countries have, and, you know, the UK have really blown by where we're at. And yet we have the best analytic instruments to carry out these yeah. studies and just haven't done it yet. Now is the time. Uh, the momentum is there. The desire is there. And there's too darn many unanswered questions not to pursue this. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, I, I want to go ahead and play that clip. I've, I've talked about it numerous times, but here's the clip talking about the sensors. And then we will come back to the clip talking about the trends and showing the chart of of trends it's it's pretty remarkable uh seeing that but it's um while this while this clip loads and gets ready here um i just uh, i want to mention again how awesome it is to see these panels happening live unfettered uh here's the clip exactly what david was pointing at a vast majority of what we have reported to us are dod sensors dod sensors are not scientific sensors they are not intelligence community sensors believe it or not intelligence community sensors are very close to scientific sensors they are calibrated they are high precision they are everything you'd ever want to know about a thing <laughs> DOD sensors have one purpose. They are to identify an object that is known and put a weapon on it. That is what they're for. 
right, predominantly. So understanding how do you calibrate those against these known objects? How do I fly an F-35 against a weather balloon at different speeds and different altitudes and different sun conditions and different lighting conditions and, and heating conditions? Those are all important measurements that need to be done, and we are on the, uh, in process of doing that right now. That table on the right is a very simplified version of our entire test matrix, which you would not be able to fit on three of these slides against all of our sensors across all of those phenomenologies. That will be useful in order to then train our operators, pilots, and sensors against the known objects. And then finally, our pattern of life analysis. This is essentially baselining what is normal. I have all these hotspot areas, but we only have hotspot areas because that's when the reports come in from the operators that are operating at that time. They don't operate all the time. So to have a 24-7 collection monitoring campaign in some of these areas, I like the way he's talking about baselining things for three months at a time, stuff like that. Uh, it's it's awesome to hear that and to hear him actively going through here. Here is the part right here talking about um, the the actual legality of using some of these sensors, uh, which is great. Um, to go down some of those characteristics to see if we can find them correlated to uh, pilot reporting. Right. Uh, some of those are um, initially this is going to be, I'm going to say this is a bootstrap method. Right? We're doing a broad spectrum search across very few indicators that we can point to that will allow, enable us to get a little bit more data, refine that narrow those um, sensors and, and, and go from there. So we aren't just relying on the DOD and IC sensors that exist today because, frankly, they don't point to where we want them to point, right? I mean, I'll be frank with, with everyone. Here it is. We, we can point the largest collection apparatus in the entire globe at any point we want. You just have to tell me where I want to point it second piece of that is a lot of what we have is is around the continental United States. Most people, including uh, the government, don't like it when I point our entire collection apparatus to your backyard. <laughs> it's, it's not allowed. We have some laws about that, and we've got to figure out how to do this only in the areas that, that I can get high confidence there's going to be something there and high confidence I'm not going to break any laws doing it. And and that's where he continues on talking about, however, um, your instruments are scientific, same as these other instruments that are used for this stuff. So, um, Noah, hey, you know, you're allowed to see what the what the weather is over Detroit all day. If, if your stuff can be calibrated to pick up these frequencies that we're looking for, uh, then we can come to you for data anytime that we get a sighting. And, and that's, that, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Yeah, it's, it's incredible, but it's also pretty vapidly honest to, to hear the head of such an agency just flat out say like, hey man, I've got access to the best of the best. But that's made to put a weapons platform on something on the other side of the world, and I'm not legally allowed to point it at your backyard. <laughs> it, it, it is funny to hear them speak in that manner, and they do have the capabilities. Oh yeah! Um, oh, absolutely. I, I, I was. I remember when I was doing research, just sharing a quick story. Please, please. Um, on on synthetic blood. And, um, and turn into a research project then for the fluids to go into deep diving suits that people can breathe. They're called, you know, flor perfluorinated ethers. Yeah. Uh, ethers. But, and, but I remember the analysis we had used, we used the gas chromatograph. And it would take about 20 minutes. I would put two or three microliters of a solution in for analysis. And it would take 20 minutes to get the results. 
big, long, charged graphs. You know, I mean, some of the, the paper ran six, eight, ten feet long uh, for the analysis. Nowadays, you can take like a picogram of the material, put it in a machine, press the button, and walk to the other table to get the results. So the analysis bit of this is so true. We have tremendous capabilities. We have capabilities that are absolutely phenomenal that the general public is not aware of and should not be aware of. Yeah. And in that regard, uh, yeah, he, he's right. They got to point him in the right direction. There's got to be better ways to accumulate the information. The problem with government work is they're all siloed. Every one of them siloed. You know, the, the Navy has their an analysis system and equipment. The Army, uh, the Space Force has theirs. So they're all in and of themselves. They're not brought together by a common thread. Again, I go back yeah. to MUFON. This is what we have done with the reports. It's all tied together in our reports. In the military industrial complex, with the sensitive instrumentation out there, they don't do that. They don't share well. They don't play well with each other in the mm. sandbox. Yeah. And they're very, very different technologies. Many yep. of their technologies are not compatible with each other. September 11th was an example of that. Yeah. Where even the walkie talkies between fire departments were not set up the same way. Yeah. So yeah. we've got a lot to learn in this country and we've got a lot more team effort to put forth and team spirit to develop, to answer these questions. Well, and uh, once again, I think the, uh, ev even with um, the Roosevelt video being a 40 mile per hour object, um, not something going 10,000 miles an hour or anything like that. Uh, what it did is open the conversation, Roy. What it did is help drop stigma, finally. Yes. Um, of reporting. And um, I know I know MUFON has seen a, a decent uptick of reporting since that over the last couple of years. Um, once again, to see an office like Arrow be created, not not just to oversee reports that come in, but to oversee the process of making a unified reporting system. So, hey, once again, uh, somebody out on a boat saw something. Hey, hey, Harbor Master, here's the form. You know, um, everybody exactly. gets the same form. And now you're talking science because before, I mean, yes, the MUFON has been doing that science and taking witness reports for years and years and years, and it's fantastic. And I think that that is the concept that they are heavily, heavily leaning upon um, for this aero reporting system. Um, and it's it's because of systems like that that this one is coming about. And, and you know, Chris, you're 100% correct. The one thing that has been overlooked in all these discussions is that MUFON has 600 field investigators. Yeah. That's a lot of boots on the ground. You know, their data and information should not be summarily dismissed because it's not, you know, scientific enough. Yeah, because it's, it's not a calibrated data set. Exactly. And, and that's more of a an elitist term saying, hey, you know, you're a bunch of jamokes out there doing this thing. You know, you're, yeah. you're not trained like we are. You don't have a degree in astrophysics. Well, I remember uh, Dr. Is it Travis uh, Taylor, is his name, on Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when he had an original TV show called um, Redneck Scientist. Yeah. Where he literally, he, he, took, he took his mother's microwave out, a brand new microwave, first one she ever had, put it in the backyard and was conducting some experiments with it and blew it up. Yeah. Now, he's, he's one of the most renowned people in this business right now. And he blew up his mom's microwave. It, Things happen. It took my Things wife happen. a while to get paid. And uh, my, my dad's whole family is from Alabama. Um, so uh, for me, it's kind of comforting. Um, like when I hear a good Cajun <laughs> accent from my mom's side, it's like, ah, oh, nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, she was like, this guy's a scientist. I was like, yes. Like astrophysicist. Like, yes, he's a scientist. 
<laughs> um, and it took her a while to get to the point, and now she loves Travis Taylor. Um, but it was yeah. it was funny. Uh, it uh, and I know numerous people like that because uh, there's there's a thick Bama in there, you know. Um, but that, and, and a, good, a good dose of Brunswick stew. And it's it's great to. It's great to see scientists like him tackling this topic with such verve, having been read on uh, to the the previous investigation group, uh, the previous government UAP panels uh, prior to Arrow. So uh, there there is good reason to be founding this office. I think it's great that they have made it public, that that it is as public as it is. Um, we'll see what comes of the recent whistleblower who came out and said there's a couple of them who have come out and said that there is actual recovered craft. Um, yes. That was that was here in the last week as well. Uh, just in the last few days that that came out. Um, and, and, and and their efforts have given MUFON. Uh, loads of credibility all mm. of a sudden. We have more people attending our meetings, wanting to learn, wanting to ask questions. Yeah. But what they are doing has really boosted MUFON as a citizen organization, a scientific citizen organization, above and beyond where it's ever been. Yeah. And, and that's gratifying to see. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once again... Uh, this panel is multiple hours long, folks. It is it is amazing. Um, I'm not going to tell you not to watch the whole four hours. I, I think everybody who is interested in this topic and interested in the research of this topic should go watch the whole four hours of this. Listen to it on your way to work. Like, it's on YouTube, man. As long as you got a cell phone signal, it'll play. Um, I think I saw one commercial throughout the whole four hours, and that was during the lunch break that they took. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, incredible information and great to see them being so open, so honest. Uh, the same way that MUFON has been about their research, uh, open book to the public um, yes. since day one. So. Uh, Roy, I want to I want to thank you for your time tonight going over this, combing through some of this footage, talking about, uh, once again, a topic in a way that, uh, unfortunately, some people don't like. Uh, and it's it's sad because, once again, it it only stymies the research to to it, come it to come at it from that point of view to have that point of view about it to try and make it so that um people are intimidated from actively doing their job of science or investigation into a topic you know um i i am not a call to action guy unless it's something of a building nature so yeah if you know people that are like that um Feel free to talk to them, folks. Uh, let them know that there's there's a more damage than good mentality going on there, uh, and they may not be aware of it, unfortunately and sadly. Uh, Roy, before we let you go, where can people go to get involved with their local MUFON chapter if they're in San Antonio uh, or in the surrounding area like me in the Texas Hill Country? Uh, how can they get a hold of you? How can they get a hold of MUFON San Antonio? How can they become a member? Uh, I am a lifetime benefactor. Um, I love nothing more than my regular MUFON newsletters uh, showing me latest cases, um, latest opinions on topics, interviews, things like that. But where can people go to join and start learning more about MUFON and the processes? How can they become a field investigator, etc., my friend? And, well, a lot of information is at MUFON. Okay, on, on the web, just look up MUFON, M-U-F-O-N. Go right to the website. Uh, there's reports you can read. The information about field investigators is there. There's a neat little thing um, now uh, where you can actually see the last 20 reported sightings and where they occurred. 
And there's a special section for us uh, field investigators that only we can access. But I'm glad you asked. Um, we're having a pretty good presentation June 27th here in San Antonio. Awesome. Um, it's a place, it's called La Melanesia, M I L E N S I A. The restaurant lets us take over the whole restaurant um, for no charge. Um, and meals are there. You can order what you want to eat. Um, Melanesa is an Argentinian type term for breaded cutlets. So you can get like breaded chicken, breaded beef, you know, whatever you want, full menu. So folks seem to enjoy that atmosphere. Yeah. Um, that's uh, June 27th. Folks start coming in about six o'clock to eat seven o'clock. The program goes on and this month we'll be giving an update on all the other Texas chapters. Cause we have, uh, through one young lady by name of, of uh, Tater Baker, and that's a pseudonym, Tater Baker. <clears throat> and she has revitalized the Rio Grande Valley chapter, started them back up. She's revitalized Houston, started them back up. Yep. Same with Dallas. And uh, actually, uh, the Brazos River Group uh, also. She uh, is the one that connected to... us. Yes. She's a phenomenal lady. Uh, high energy. I never give her any coffee. No need to. No <laughs> coffee for her. Um, but she's done a magnificent job in the state of Texas. Uh, she'll be presenting update on che- Texas chapters. The program that evening will be a 15 to 20 minute program um, regarding uh, radio communications when an event occurs, the spam hits the fan. Uh, SHTF is commonly heard, uh, called. I changed the wording on that, by the way. Truly not spam hits the fan, but another four letter word goes in there. Um, <laughs> and we'll be talking about radio communications because no matter what the threat is, whether it's terrestrial or extraterrestrial, people have got to realize how, how frail our communication systems are and how frail yeah. our infrastructure is. And yes. that's probably the next big thing we'll have to deal with here in this country, but uh, we'll be covering all those topics. <laughs> And, you know, basically how you can be safe and remain in communication for probably under $300 total. Oh, wow. So that's what the program, yeah, that's what the program looks like. It covers everything from the FCC viewpoint, Federal Communications Commission. And there's actually five classifications for radios now. Yep. And that, that's going to be covered very, very thoroughly. Yeah, it is, it is much so. easier to get a ham license than it used to be. You no longer have to be able to key code all that kind of stuff. It's it's pretty remarkable. No Morse code. Yeah. And there's actually one right below that called GMRS. Yep. General Mobile Radio Service. Yes. And that's a licensing operation also. And that's, that's the one I like to tell people, you can do this. It's push button. You can do this. You know, it has to be, uh, and, and, and Elmer's, we call them in ham radio. Are, are you teaching that, that Roy? Say what? Are, um, yes, I didn't want to brag, but I'm, I'm giving that course. Yes, oh, that program. I want to. I want to have you back on just to do a whole episode about that. Um, you, because I, Chris, you know how much I enjoy working with you. I'll be more than glad to do whatever you ask me, as long as it doesn't involve a six-figure loan. Right, as long as it doesn't involve dressing up like little Bo Peep. Um, <laughs> no, 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 nothing of that nature. I assure you. Uh, but, you. but in all sincerity, um, I am a radio freak. I've, I had a CB radio in my car as a teenager. I, I have a whole radio kit in my closet, all kinds of things. I am a huge advocate of citizen band radio, people understanding how to keep communicated, how to, how to keep in touch um, cell phones are a squirrely little thing, man, but it's amazing how far you can reach out with a little whip of wire um, yeah. and and talk to people and keep in communication. And I would I would love to do a whole preparation episode um, just talking about citizen band and how to how to stay connected in a in a non-connected world, Roy. I'd love to do it with you. Given your background, uh, you probably know a hell of a lot more than I do. But I don't know about that. that. It's a good. <laughs> it's a good. Gen, it's a good general program because things appear to be a little shaky right now on this yeah. good old 
blue marble of ours. And uh, yep. you need to understand there's some real quick, easy ways where if something does occur. That's right. Uh, let's pray that it doesn't. But you will be prepared literally for less than $300. You will know everything that's going on. Well, I, I definitely want to do that with you. And I, good luck with that meeting. I hope that goes well. Um, when is that meeting again? That will be uh, Tuesday evening, June 27th, uh, at La Melanesa on Nacogdoches in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, great little restaurant and a very good meeting space. Cool. And uh, we'll food, food up at 6 p.m. and program at 7. And we run on time. And the, the only restaurant allows us to have Tuesday evening to ourselves. Uh, so we sort of take over the, the Mufonians, as I call us, uh, take over. And <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I use that term today in our staff meeting. You're like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Mufonians. <laughs> so uh, he gives us free run in the place. And, uh, yeah, and that's we stopped doing Zooms, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, we were concerned about privacy issues for some of the speakers. Oh, yeah. And uh, you, you know, some of the, as we call them, experiencers. Yep. Um, you know, so we decided to do away with the Zoom. It's, Zoom's great, but we'd rather do it in person. So come on down, enjoy some yeah. excellent, excellent food. And uh, the crowd is uh, extremely irreverent. Uh, <laughs> folks from Austin would love it. Well, um, I look forward to making my first one here locally with you. Uh, Roy, once again, thank you so much for your time. I will be in touch with links with this uh, tomorrow, everything else. Take care of yourself. And have a great evening, my friend. Chris, as always, I've had a great evening because I got to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, talk to you very, very soon. You got it, sir. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Man, always a great conversation with him, whether on air or off. Uh, make sure to stop on by and check out MUFON.com, folks. Um, I'm serious. If you are anywhere about this kind of investigative work uh become a supporter i i make no money for mufon they are not a sponsor of this show i am a sponsor of their conference every year because i firmly believe in what mufon does i believe in the concept of citizen science i believe in the concept of good organizations and good people like sev talk uh, who are part of the experiencer response team uh, who are experiencers themselves that are doing great work to help heal people and help people connect with why this happened in their life. Um, it's it's a great and beautiful thing. So stop on by and check that out, folks. MUFON.com is, of course, where you can go and check out everything that is MUFON while you're online checking that out. Make sure to stop on by CuriousRealm.com. That is the website. That's where you can find us. That's where you can tune in live every week, CuriousRealm.com forward slash live. That's where you can find the store, CuriousRealm.com forward slash store. And buy books from all of our guests like Kathleen Martin, the founder of the uh, Experiencer resource team for MUFON, as well as Sev Talk, everybody else. Um, while you're online checking that out, Make sure to stop on by and check out the Knowledge Vault, CuriousRealm.com forward slash knowledge. That will give you all of the declassified documents that we talk about. When we come back from commercial break, speaking of talking, we will be talking with the amazing, awesome Ella LeBain, uh, the author of Who's Who in the Cosmic Zoo, about... Uh, solar anomalies, strange things going on with the sun, solar cycles. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the planet Nibiru and and what its possible perturbations on the planet and solar system would be upon its passing. Uh, so all that coming up right after this.
With the rise in attention to the health benefits of cannabis and cannabinoids, including CBD, True Hemp Science has become one of the premier providers of full-spectrum CBD and CBD-related products. Using a proprietary spigeric process, True Hemp Science extracts maximum benefit from the whole hemp plant. Buds, leaves, stems, seeds, even roots. Every part of the plant is used and then reused to formulate a rich, complex profile of CBD, CBD derivatives, and terpenes guaranteed to provide the relief and benefits you need daily. Visit TrueHemScience.com to experience the best CBD oils, edibles, and topicals on the market today. And use code CURIOUS7 to save 7% off your entire purchase of $50 or more and get two 25 milligram CBD cookies or brownies free. That website again is TrueHemScience.com and the code is CURIOUS7. Have you considered starting a podcast? Looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies, Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today. And let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultation workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast-related on the Internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training. And use code CURIOUS20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website again is podcastcadet.com. Curious Realm Podcast is your source for the latest and greatest news and events in the world of the paranormal, esoteric, and forbidden knowledge. And there's no better way to spark the conversation than with items from the Curious Realm store. Choose from fan favorites like hoodies, mouse pads, coffee mugs, and more. Buy books and items from your favorite Curious Realm guests. Get your hands on the latest gear for paranormal investigations and experiments we discuss on the show. Open your web browser and stop on by the Curious Realm store at CuriousRealm.com forward slash store to buy the latest Curious Realm wear and out of this world gifts for yourself, your family, or a mind that you want to open. That website again is CuriousRealm.com forward slash store well hello everybody and welcome to this part of the episode chris jordan here with you in a pre-recorded fashion uh busy out on the road doing all kinds of fun stuff but as always bringing you new content never never replay never rehash of old material um always brand new stuff whenever i'm on the road our guest tonight is the amazing Ella LeBain. She is the author of 
who's who in the cosmic zoo, the whole series, there's, there's a whole series of who's who in the cosmic zoo books. They are all of course available over at, uh, curious uh, curious realm.com forward slash store is the website. You can also find them on her website. Who's who in the cosmic zoo. Welcome back to the show. Ella LeBane. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me back. It's always good to talk to you. Always a pleasure yeah. having you on. Thank you. How how was your recent uh, recent holy season? Everything else? Oh, it was lovely. Yes, very nice. Fantastic. Um, now, uh, whenever we have you on, it's typically to talk about Earth anomalies, uh, sun anomalies, things like that. Here lately, we have had quite a bit of activity coming from the sun it's been um relentless i i guess yeah that is the that's the easiest way to put it i mean i live on texas i live in texas which is well if you live in texas you know it's one of the hottest places in the country to live um it it's almost like living on the surface of the sun um wow. but but even yeah. still it's it's interesting to see uh the insane solar storms that we have been having uh so much so that uh, you know northern lights being seen down into the middle of central north america yes we've we've been seeing them in colorado which yes. is why we can't exactly. call them northern anymore yeah they're just lights they're auroras yes they're, it's been um pretty amazing um well, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, if you remember last year, there were uh, multiple cracks in the magnetosphere. So every time there's a solar storm, coronal mass ejections wave out over the Earth, and they get in to our atmosphere through the cracks in the magnetic field. So that's one reason. The other reason is the pole shift. We we have uh, our magnetic poles have moved forty degrees. So we are uh, we used to have the North Magnetic Pole uh, in the Canadian Arctic, and now it's in Siberia. Yeah, yeah, precisely, and it it really does. Uh bring forth an amazing question you know uh, once again especially about the north pole drifting i will i will bring that up real quick for everybody to see because not everybody understands that that is actively happening right now to the earth and this is not yes. something strange this is not something new this is a pretty almost geologically regularly scheduled event indeed and yes even even right now, uh, the the magnetic field of Earth, uh, there it is, talking about the pole reversal, uh, and that's from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Um, right. And the last one occurred uh, 780,000 years ago. Um, and once again, and they say, you know, pose no immediate threat. Uh, not necessarily that it poses an immediate threat. You know, I'm I'm not going to say that a pole flip because, you know, oddly enough, things are fairly equal. You know, that's why it's called an equator in the middle. Things, once you get to the extremes of the poles, are just about the same um, yes, temperature wise, stuff like that. So that's um, true. It's it's just a, a tilt. Yeah. So it still stays equal. Um, when it, when the Earth tilts, so it's tilted forty degrees, not not a hundred and eighty, mm -hmm. not yet, but that is prophesied to happen. So, um, the Book of Isaiah, chapter twenty four, talks about how the Earth is going to be turned upside down, which is basically biblical vernacular for pole shift. Which, as you already stated, has happened before. So, um, so there's the magnetic poles, and then there's the actual physical poles, and uh, both are going to get 
turned around, um, especially when this system passes. And, um, you know, the the nemesis, I call it the nemesis Nibiru system because yeah. it's it's a system. It's not just one object. A lot of people like to just focus on Nibiru, and Nibiru is definitely one of the biggest uh, of it all, you know. I mean, but that has not um, passed us yet. Um, and but but it, it precedes uh, all of this other stuff. So that's why we're having an uptick in comets, asteroids, uh, meteor showers, meteorites, fireballs, because all of its like junk <laughs> comes ahead of it. And the, the sun is perturbed because of the other the, 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 mag, the um, uh, magnetic uh, pull. It's magnetism. So, I mean, it's it's a form of gravity, if you want to look, you know, because there's all this kind of space vernacular that they that they use to talk about the gravity of the sun, the gravitational pull. But it's really magnetism where the sun is kind of having an exchange with this other system and it creates perturbations. So so yeah. as it's creating perturbations, the sun starts to spew uh, its, you know, uh, plasma. So there's a lot of stuff coming out of the sun. And we've just uh, seen in the past month three coronal holes show up. I mean, we're in uh, the solar cycle 25, so... You know, it's an eleven-year cycle, and and these sunspots uh, are are cyclical. This is nothing unusual. But what is unusual is is the fact that it's like opening up more. Yeah. Okay? And you and we're getting way more um, coronal I, mass ejections, solar flares. I remember when they developed the classification of an X-class solar flare. And what a what a phenomenal thing that was. The, yeah, like, I can't believe that we are making this classification. This is such a large leap in what we know about solar flares uh, when it happened. And that was, you know, maybe 20 years ago now. Um, mm, that, that makes sense. Yeah. They are they are reclassified regularly. Yes. Now. And each one, so you have the C class, the M class, and the X class, which is the worst, but each one has like three tiers to it. So yeah. there's like X1, X2, X3, and, you know, God forbid, I mean, that's one of the our biggest fears is for an X3, you know, to hit the Earth because that would put us in the dark ages. That would knock out the satellites, and, and that's one of our biggest fears. So, yeah. um, but we have been having X1 uh, class flares, and that creates a lot of disturbance. Um, so we're, you know, they have instruments around the planet. The main one is in Tomsk, Russia, uh, and also Lithuania and Italy uh, to measure the Schumann resonance, uh, which it's called the Schumann resonance, but it's basically the Earth's heartbeat, which is 7.83 hertz, which is wired into our DNA. And all living things on the Earth sort of resonate with this frequency. It's it's a life force. And 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 it it, it 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 has to do with a combination of things that 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 uh, ha- has to do with our magnetosphere and the sun. So the fact that there's been cracks in the magnetosphere, it what, every time there's a flare and a, a you know a CME, it waves yeah. over the it gets into it gets in and it raises the Schumann resonance, the Schumann frequency. So like today, um, like as we're speaking, it's 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 literally gone off the charts the past three days. There was another M. We had an M class yep. there today. So and people and animals and all living things feel it. 
you know, I mean, whether you recognize it or not, and you go, oh, what's going on today? You know, it feels a little intense, the energies. And, um, and this is why astrology, <laughs> if, I, if I could go here for a minute. Oh, feel free. Does, doesn't really work anymore. OK, because this sort of well, it is a form of astrology in, in terms of taking the sun's energies and saying, well, what kind of a day you're going to have. But but when people look to the planets, it, this this energy that's coming from the sun completely trumps and overrides all these other energies that are coming in. OK, so it's it's overwhelming at times. And. It's it's kind of like the big thing, mm. um, because when when Nibiru passes the Earth, which hasn't happened yet, but when it does, it's going to pass twice. So the sun is now, you know, experiencing this system coming into its space. And that's where all these perturbations are showing up, not just on the sun, but other planets in our solar system and, of course, the Earth. So the pole shift that, that we're talking about is not just limited to Earth. We, we've been seeing um, uh, data that it's, it's also happening on Mars. It's also uh, there are the other planets in our solar system are being affected by this. Yes. And Jupiter is one of the, you know, we always used to call Jupiter the big cosmic fatso because it would, you know, be like this protective, almost like a second sun. Uh, and it would be this protective body in our solar system. And it has uh, basically taken the hit for Earth a few times. Oh, yeah. So, like, if people Shoemaker remember... Levy. Exactly. That's exactly where I, what I was going to say. You read my mind. Shoemaker Levy, 1994. Yeah. I mean, all, and that that was the beginning of this system coming in because it comes in through the Oort cloud. So those comets, the, all that, that whole string, it was like a string of pearls that hit Jupiter. You know, like Jupiter took the hit f for Earth on that one. So, you know... I, I know you know about the DART program, and this is why it's it's kind of like one of their big, uh, you know, NASA's big program is to get ahead of these asteroids and either redirect them, nudge yeah. them out of orbit, or blow them up completely to protect the Earth. But there is one coming, you know, that could really do a lot of damage. So. Well, and I, I think really, especially whenever it comes to the DART uh, concept, which was incredibly successful, you know, um, there there have been numerous, I mean, there are movies based on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the whole movie Armageddon, you know. Bruce, Bruce Willis. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, great vehicle for, for that concept. And... Totally. It was really impressive. Even even they said, like, wow, we are really like pretty impressed with, you know, first shot. And that's how yes. that went. Uh, and such incredible results. And they're still looking at the results uh, that they were able to get from the moment of impact. Um, but the real disturbing thing is some of the utter lack of, I mean, a thank God for backyard astronomers. Um, Shoemaker yes. Levy was a prime example of that. That was found by backyard astronomers. Um, but uh, in addition, there have been a couple of really close calls lately where things have hit and made impact where there were there was zero warning. Zero yeah. warning of it. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, this is an ongoing situation that. Um, you know, I mean, people just have to prepare their souls because when it happens, that's it. It's going to happen. Um, there is uh, something coming in 2029. I think they call it Ap Apophis, Apophis, mm -hmm. which is the, the Greek destroyer. Um, but it's not it's not supposed to hit the Earth, but it's going to come very close and uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, the Bible prophecy talking about wormwood, 
which is part of the Nibiru system. Yeah. And, you know, the words wormwood, which means bitterness, um, has been associated with Nibiru because of what it does to the earth each time it passes. But this, uh, you know, the whole passage in the book of Revelation talks about it actually like hitting the earth. Nibiru, Nibiru is not going to hit the earth, but a, a parts of its system, like an asteroid, is that's what that prophecy is about. That that basically takes out one third of the Earth's uh, water, and you know, it, and turns it bitter, and and destroys one third of the creatures, and so this is all part of that pole shift in play. Because as I was saying, so when Nibiru passes, it passes the first time; it goes around the sun and, and does its normal or you know its orbit. Yeah. And then yeah. the sun's energy catapults it back out into its orbit and it passes the earth a second time. And that second pass is the is the, the big one. That's the worst one. And that's the one where the poles absolutely flip and that's where they stay until, you know, until the next time or whatever. So and that's happened before. Velikovsky wrote about it. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's in our history. So it's, and, and, and what's interesting is because we are living through this time we call an apocalypse, which basically means revelation or disclosure. So, so everything is coming up for us to, uh, you know, it's like we revisit stuff from the past. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for instance, land masses that have been covered up are going to be uh, are going to emerge from all of this. So uh, Antarctica, for instance, um, that I'm sure you know you've talked about this on your shows. You know, it, it it there's a lot of history there. There's there's holes, there's caverns, there's stuff going on underground, and a lot of people believe that that it was yep. part of the old Atlantis. So and then that got covered up with with ice because of the last pole shift and so when the poles shift again it's going to be you know un like sort of reversed and undone because there's going to be a new south pole that's not going to be the south the new south you know that's the old yeah. south pole. <laughs> so yeah we just move forward that way so well and uh, you know especially when you're talking about the perturbations of the sun like you're saying the because uh, the the sun is not solid. It's gas. Uh, so, yeah, the the gravitational perturbation of that would squeeze it. It would it would be very stressful on the environment of something like the sun, Jupiter, uh, that that any any gas giant on its way in just through the gravitational warping. Yes. Of something like that coming through. Good. Good words. Gravitational warping. Yes, that's exactly how to describe it. I mean, everything is just going to get so whacked out. It's, or, yeah. It already is. And that's why we're seeing all these, you know, the weather, uh, you know, the, the geological weather, I mean, and the solar weather. It, it's all connected. Um, I had sent you some slides, I think, about the the technology that they have. Um, oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, sh that shows uh, the planet around the sun. Yeah, it, it's it's undeniable that they that there's stuff going on around the sun. Um, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, that yes. one right there from 2021 is pretty remarkable, and there there have been. Yes. Numerous things uh, that yes. that have popped up as Good. anomaly uh, near near and around the sun. I'm trying to remember if I got all of those images from you today or not. Um, yeah, I don't some know of them if I was been... able to get all of them, but uh... yeah, that's good. And and some of them were from last time. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, so there's a lot of technology. So this is also kind of important to put into the mix because when people are looking up and they're seeing all kinds of different anomalies, 
some things are deceiving to the eyes and uh, people are seeing different shapes, like the sun is, you know, looking like it's an octagon or it's looking like a flashlight. You know, our sun is a yellow star, always has been. And um, now it's like this bright white flashlight type uh, light. Okay. And that's because of there's just so much technology up there. Like there's a ton of stuff. Um, I, I think I had sent you this um, sort of like chart that has all these different and there's like all these uh, uh, satellites and the SOHO, the coronagraph, the LASCO coronagraph space telescope. Mm -hmm. um, but even more than that, they have mirrors up there. There's all kinds of prisms. And this started way back in the 80s during the Reagan uh, era when when he sort of coined the phrase, you know, the Star Wars program, which was the, the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that's when everybody started talking about weapons in space. And they knew back then that Nibiru was coming in because they were tracking it. And what I found to be really interesting was that there was a blackout. Like it, like in in my fifth book, The Heavens, I kind of go over this in terms of um, the research that back in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, it, it, it's just all the astronomy magazines talked about it. They were constantly searching for Planet X, and then of course. Zachariah Sitchin's material emerged uh, in the in the sixties and the seventies, and until in in the um, the eighties, and he had that meeting with the NASA uh, chief uh, astronomer Robert S. Harrington, and they basically collaborated and and compared notes. And uh, Sitchin was coming from the ancient history, the, the Sumerian records, and and Harrington was coming from present space telescopes because they were tracking this. And and they both sort of agreed that that it was coming in from around the same uh, place, you know, like Virgo Libra, and it was coming from the south, the southwest, and it was going to come up through the southwest. So you know, that was all fine and good. And then within a year, not even, he comes down, Harrington comes down with this rare form of esophageal cancer and dies. And Sitchin gets um, threatened uh, not to talk about uh, when Nibiru is coming, uh, is going to pass the earth because uh, they were going to shut down his lectures. So that's why he was always very tight lipped about it. And, and, and so there was a blackout. Okay. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because that created this blackout period where they, you, 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 people couldn't talk about it. There was an executive order that came down through the Reagan administration that was, that paired this under a national security issue with, uh, you know, cover to cover it up. Um, with the alien presence and the UFO disclosure stuff that they didn't want to talk about back then, it was it was sort it was sort of rolled into these executive orders that like people hardly even read. You know, it's like you know, like a paragraph within a bill, just kind of like how they how we got UFO disclosure recently with the COVID bill and how it was like mm. a little addendum. You know, and now we're we're in disclosure. So and now they can talk about it again, because when, you know, Trump came in, he undid the Obamacare. And, and it, believe it or not, the whole thing got I, I, I sort of documented this in my book, how it got rolled over and sort of hidden where I'm going with this. Basically, why I'm telling you this is the relevance of this is that back in the 80s. They collaborated about the the space stuff, putting stuff up in space. And part of that had to do with oh. um, their efforts, okay, their intentions to retard 
the global warming, to sort of set it back a bit by putting up mirrors and 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 different types of you know space tech to take the sun's energy and sort of move it away from the earth to stop the warming. So <clears throat> the point is is that now we have like dozens of objects up there. So when people are looking, you know, through their telescopes, just looking at the sky and they're taking pictures and they're getting all this stuff, we're, we're seeing, you know, and everybody, you know, this is like goes on on a daily basis on, on the Internet. And, oh, that's a lens flare. Oh, it's a camera flare. Oh, it's this, it's that. Well, actually, I mean, besides the lens flares and the camera flares, which do exist, there's also refractions, okay, that is happening that, yeah. that is sort of like a... You could totally. I mean, even even if, if even despite any crazy mirrors, things like that, feel free to look, take a look at any communication satellite that is round and covered with mirrored surfaces. Yes, that you know, if it's passing the sun at just the right angle from where you're at. Yeah. Absolutely, you could get a large flash of light coming towards you. That's right. And that's what's happening. There's like a lot of refracting mm. light, prism type stuff, and things that yeah. really sort of like trick the eye. And people think that they're seeing something and it's really, it's it, there's a ton of technology. So so this makes the the job of discernment even harder. Because because you're you're not just looking at, you know, oh, there's an object. It's how is this object? And sometimes, so this is not a perfect system, as all of our technology isn't, okay? It's glitchy, okay? And 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 it, it, sometimes if you get it at the right time and the right angle, what light can do is illuminate. Mm. So it can expose what it's trying to cover up. So it's trying to obfuscate with prisms and lights. And yet sometimes you're actually seeing the object that they're that they're trying to obfuscate with the light because the light can do, you know, it's just like the sun as it rises in the morning, it completely cancels out the stars. You don't see the stars because the the sunlight obfuscates it. So it's the same kind of concept with all these mirrors. So I just wanted to, to to mention that because there's a lot of people posting pictures of stuff and some of it is our space tech. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and you know, uh that is a, as as you know, Ella, that's a lot of what I like to do on this show, it's not about breaking hearts, things like that. It's about demystifying, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and really when you're talking investigation period, you've got to get rid of what's there and known quantitives yes. until you leave anomaly, you right. know, and, and unfortunately, uh, get, get, we both belong to a lot of the same communities online, um, mm -hmm. things like that. And unfortunately, I think people's want for personal confirmation and want of confirmation of belief, period. Yeah, that's um, a big piece. Over, of it. Overwhelms their it's sometimes literal common sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I saw somebody today who... Pretty, pretty decent name in the community and was like, if, if this video is real, it's absolutely amazing. And I was like, wow, that that's literally a video of an RGB color change LED, like just coming at the camera, like in oh, darkness. Oh, I didn't see it. That's You'll all it is. That's all it is. I'll try to find okay. it again. Oh, but yeah. I was like, I, I, I hate to break your heart. Dude, but as somebody who plays with a lot of electronics and has literally a drawer full of color change lights, that's just somebody with a double A battery and a color change LED in a dark room. Right. Like it's, that's that's exactly what that is. And and this it's a smoke and mirrors show. Yeah. Okay. So this is where knowledge comes in because if you know that the, that this has been there since the eighties, 
and they have just been adding mm-hmm. to it and improving on it and for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it's not just for cover up. That's part of it. But the other part of it is because they're trying to ch- modify the weather on Earth. They're trying to change the atmosphere or 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 protect it from the sun's warming, which, you know, maybe might buy some time, but it's not going to uh, prevent what's coming upon the earth. No. So I just want to put that no. out there. But, you know, well, you make a good point about, you know, the power of belief and how it, people just want to have that confirmed. There's also the of uh, the flip side of it, which is the denial. OK. Yeah. Oh, Where sure. It's sure. like they, you know, you got to prove things. you got to show it. Well, I it's mean, like- proof is great. Yeah. Proof is great. Um, And, and this is the example that I give everybody. Um. You believe in that big dude in the sky in any capacity? Now prove it to me. Well, because you're and, here. The well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could go through eighty-five miracles that have happened in the world uh, that'll cross all yeah. barriers. You know what I mean? You're but here. but yeah. the thing is, and I give this argument to both sides. You know, just kind of yeah. sitting in the middle. And you know, yeah. my audience knows I was a seminary student, but I'm willing to have the debate. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, the void it's not, it's, of a creator, you know. Th- that's right. And there's other little sub creators too. And every every right? person that I know that is, you know, oh, there's a, that doesn't exist. I'm like, well, unfortunately, you are in the great minority of the world. Mm-hmm. Because the greater minority is the uh, greater majority is the crazy person that believes in the sky god that you're talking about, the sky man. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and whether it's UFOs, whether it's God, whether it's, you know, the the reincarnation of the Buddha, whether it's Muhammad, what have you, uh, or Abraham, you know, um, yeah, yeah. The, well, the, the greater this... majority is willing to believe and that... and suspend evidence for belief. That's true. And that and it's really um Good that you mentioned that because that's also part of this end time technology, which mm. they call the Blue Beam Project. Oh. Where, yeah. Pre- so they're using that belief that you just described of everybody all around the world, right? And their their intention is to project. You know, it, it like, oh, maybe over India, it's going to be Buddha, maybe over America, it's going to be Christ, maybe over, you know, the Muslim countries, it's going to be Muhammad. And to to match everybody's belief systems that they're seeing in the sky, you know, and this is all part of this end time madness that they're trying to cover up what's going on instead of just letting what's supposed to happen happen naturally yeah yeah and, oh oh the voices <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right i mean these are the technologies the these are the yep. technologies that we're up against ella yep. literally it, i mean we 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 talk, we are activists on this show for people who are targeted individuals folks who mm-hmm. claim to be targeted by technologies like this even if it's the fact of you have contractors out there testing it for you know because you got to have some kind of efficacy use before it hits a battlefield you know um and they've tried doing it in prisons we got in a lot of trouble for that (laughs) if you remember mk ultra yeah mk ultra that's right um, experimented on the soldiers and 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 prisoners and Mm -hmm. unwitting people all kinds of stuff unconscionable interesting as we discuss with dr john hall and dr robert duncan uh regularly that there is no law that prevents the government from experimenting on the public zero very sad none well and that's Um, also the my labs you know oh yeah yeah, and and that's just it, you know. Uh, and that it it goes down even to you know controlled media. You think mm-hmm. there's not controlled media? That's funny because we have an office of anti propaganda propaganda mm-hmm. that was that was funded a, a few presidents ago as one of them left office. 
uh, that was part of his final Na National Defense Authorization Act was the funding of the Office of Anti-Propaganda Propaganda, which is, I mean, remove anti. It's just a propaganda office. Yeah. That's all just it is. Ch changing just... the narratives, <laughs> pushing certain narratives. That's just a really polite way to narrative. say we now have a propaganda office. Yes. And, and this all ties into the prophecies. You know, when I tied this all in in my books, I don't, you know, it's it's the Bible isn't isn't the only source because the Bible has been edited. So the there are, of a Yes. Of many, it's but, one. That's right. And there's other sources that were rejected out of the Bible that are still relevant, such as uh, the Colburn Bible, which which was, you know, this ancient Egyptian. Three you know, quarters of the Bible written even Christian. That's right. Uh, Newsflash, folks. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, that's why you have to take pieces and put it all together. And one of the things that it talks about is the the madness, the end time mental disorders and madness. So, you know, all this, the propaganda and everything you were just talking about, you know, the voices in the head, the lasers, the blue beams, it's, it's all playing into that because this was written you know, 30, uh, 5,000 years ago, 3,500 BC approximately. So, you know, how they knew that back then, that this was going to happen now, and whether it happens through technology or just the fact that the earth is heating up and, you know, through the Schumann frequency and people are feeling it like every day, like it causes, you know, headaches and, and sleeplessness and fatigue and, and all these physical symptoms um, that just creates madness. Okay, so yeah. this is something that that you know the end time madness that people have to contend with. That it's like literally bringing all of the stuff, everybody's stuff, their shadow parts, whatever you want to call them, up to be dealt with. And maybe it's you know we can you know pontificate that it's a cleansing, it's a detoxification. Of the old guard, yeah, and and you know changing, we're, we're transitioning into a the, whole new. The tribulation world. is mm -hmm. is how most most revelatory Christians would mm -hmm. put it. And the tribulation, yes, and but they say they see it as like a seven year thing. Oh and, yeah, yeah. Know, like, I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's also the. Uh, I've never got. Uh, we'll have debates with anybody ella but the the one i've never understood is the 144,000 um i guess my odds just would not be that great to be one of the 144,000 out of the entirety of creation to to get through the gate you know uh, well i think there's a lot but you there's, know, there's that's just it there are, are misunderstood there are a lot of misunderstood scriptures and there yeah. are a lot of interpretations of misunderstood scripture. Right. That plays into people's, you yeah. know, uh, it's like belief and wishful thinking. I mean, you know, when I started getting into this back in uh, 1980, when they started telling me about, mm -hmm. oh, have nothing to do with the UFO phenomenon. The, the, the church said this to me because mm. I, you know, I was raised Jewish and then yeah. I saw, I saw Yeshua. Okay. And I know you know this, but just for your audience I, I saw him you know and this was like an like a a close encounter experience broad daylight mm. in the middle of the negev desert in israel wow. so i was like okay they sent me to israel to get an education i came back with jesus you know it's a heck of an education <laughs> and, and and you know <laughs> jesus, yeah definitely it's not what you know it's who you know you know so but the, you know jews can't handle that so here yeah, i was a lot you know, i know a, what i know <laughs> I know what I saw. It's a big matzo ball, so to speak. It's a big matzo ball. <laughs> There's a lot of matzo to swallow there. There's a lot. <laughs> that's great. Um, so, you know, that sort of started me on this whole path. And then I had these Christians tell me, because I back then I was like, I had books. I had uh, books on UFOs and, you know, close all this stuff I was studying since I was like 13, you know, Chariots of the Gods. And they looked at my stuff and they said, 
have nothing to do with the UFO phenomenon because when the rapture happens, the devil is going to lie to the rest of the world that we were all taken up and abducted by aliens. And I'm, I'm 18 years old and I look at them and they go, huh? I was like, and I'm, and that was probably that that influenced me more than anything to do all this research because yeah. I had to get to the bottom of that. I had to know what were they talking about? Why would that even happen? But now I see that that is a belief system in in Christian circles, and and some of it is denial, and some of it is. A, a bit of both, you know, truth and lie and all of this mixed up because they and misunderstanding of what this tribulation period is about. And also if there is a, a even a rapture to be in. I, at yeah. first I believed in it. And then after doing research, I went like, well, you know, I I'm I believe God can do anything. OK, because he's God and I'm not. OK, so that's where I go. Oh, and if, absolutely. And if, if it's his will to rapture and, you know, lift people off the earth to save them from destruction, from his destruction. So, you know, you get into the weeds here and you go into the scriptures and it clearly says that that people who believe Man. in him are are not appointed to his wrath. OK, it doesn't say anything about the other guys. Wrist. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about avoiding all wrath that you got out of jail free card. Yes, exactly. That you're going to get past any suffering that's still that's going to happen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and Jesus said himself that in this life, you will have tribulation. That's right. You will have trouble. And we all know, you know, we live long enough. You see a lot of stuff. You have it. You have trouble. So so the tribulation period that that they speak of that's in the prophecy is 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 part of us it's it's clearly it says seven years okay which comes out of the book of daniel yep. um and how they you know calculate seven years because it's it's written in days and it's it's all about israel yeah okay it's called the time of jacob's trouble and of course you know jacob became israel right of jesse's his stem name. The name changed. Yeah. So, 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 ha one thing that I found really fascinating was <clears throat> when I started studying the 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 cycles of Nibiru. I saw that that, and I put this in the book. This is, you know, I put my research in there so people could do their own homework. Um, is that the time that it takes for it to pass when it comes and it passes the Earth the first time, goes around the Sun and passes the earth the second time is seven years. Okay. So that I was like, Oh, wow. Could that, Interesting. Have, could that be the seven year end time tribulation that changes the world? So, so I'm yeah, not saying because... it is, but it's very similar to what's written in the Bible and how the, the Isaiah 24 how the Lord says he's going to turn the earth upside down and lay everything to waste and kind of start all over again. You yeah. know, it's happened before. And then I found like, okay, so, you know, like the Native American tribes. So they have a rule in their prophetic um, belief system that anyone who does prophecy, they need to know the past. They need to know the history because the past is prologue. So if you don't understand the past, you can never, in, in Native American terms, predict the future because the future is connected to the past. And again, I thought, wow, you know, that is just that's another piece that, mm. that fits because this has happened already. This happened. This is nothing new. So if and that's why Sitchin's material was so valuable, because he kind of, you know, pulled it up from the past. He, he you know, he, yeah. he, and people like to uh, criticize him. It's like, no, nobody's perfect. You know, like, it, it, it's not you feel free perfection. to go translate cuneiform. Right. I mean, who can and figure it out while you're doing it. 
Exactly. And he spoke five languages fluently. Okay. So he, to him, that was sort of easy for him to understand it because he had knowledge of Hebrew and Akkadian and, and Aramaic and, you know, Canaveram and all the Hebrew stuff comes right out of Samaria. Yeah. So, so, you know, at least he started something. And, you know, when people do research, it's, it's but, not about, oh, this is the be all and end all. It's like, OK, well, here, here's a start. Now, you it's like a baton race. But, but now he, pass the baton on to the next researcher yeah. and now you expand and go with it. Well, and, and even then, though, Ella, once again, to know the past, not not everybody understands. Uh, I, I would venture to say some folks understand uh, that if it's Hebrew, it probably came from Samaria. Yes, and that could also be uh, offensive to some people because they 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 are myopic and they think that oh it's all but if about you understand Jewish history Jewish yes and if, but for those who don't but there are yeah. people there are Christians who think the Earth is six thousand years old sure because the Bible you know they think that it all started in yeah. Genesis but that was just the Genesis the book of Genesis is really a it's synopsis a yeah yeah. It's a synopsis of what happened before that flood. There were two floods. So so the civilization, I, I think we were talking about this earlier, and I want to mention his name because his his research is relevant, and mm. that's uh, Graham Hancock. Uh, who, oh, God, yeah. Who, yeah, who goes into the history based on the archaeology, yep. based on, you know, the age of the earth, the times of the, the floods, and the um, the cataclysms, okay. So that's that's what's so relevant is that this has happened before, and and if we can just like you know draw on that, you know, like historically, then it gives us some kind of basis to deal with what's happening now. That's all. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, there's quite a bit of that out there and that that's a lot of what graham hancock's series goes into is the fact that there there's quite a bit of study even even out there in the world of archaeology right now that people just are not aware of um they, a lot of it gets yeah suppressed because it's fairly french it doesn't go along uh what is found doesn't go along with the known narrative um so so it doesn't get the fanfare. That's right. And, um, and you know, religion, you know, because we talk, you talked about belief and religion and people who think that, you know, everything started 6,000 years ago when the Bible was written. They, yeah. they don't even like take into consideration, like you said, Jewish history and Bible history. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is something that I. Yeah. Uh, your calendar is totally different. Yeah. Entirely I mean, different. If you I, if you go find an Orthodox Jew. That's right. And and there, it, it's not just about how they told time, but it's also about how the Bible was put together. Yeah. Because they they suppressed. I mean, it was all edited right. at, during, you know, the Constantine. Oh, yeah. Constantine, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the and, councils, yeah. all this. Yeah. The first council of Nicaea was the one that really basically was like, OK, guys, we got something going here. We really need to get the brand solid. Yes. Um, and, so and so what we need to do is we've got all these books from the New Testament and they're great. All cool stuff. Sorry, but some people don't know about these because they're very regional. Some people don't read these because they don't agree with them. Uh, so we're going to we're going to basically take the New Testament, call it together into a cohesive story um, about Christ and what's the Old Testament we will make sure what's there supports the New Testament. Yes. And because there's a lot of the Old Testament that, yeah, um, is there is there in Jewish tradition, but it ain't it ain't here. And if you if you yeah. go into uh, a King James Bible, you definitely will not find Bell and the Dragon. 
Oh, yeah. There's about 75 books missing. Yeah. But but a lot of that also has to do with the church agenda. Oh, sure. You know, like they wanted. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, it was and... we're getting a brand straight We're we are figuring out the Coca-Cola swoosh right now, man. Yeah, exactly. And guess what's on everything? Coca-Cola doesn't matter if it says Coca-Cola or Coke. That swoosh is there. The, there you go. Yeah. Because that's little... the branding. So so that's why, you know, there's like a crisis going on, yeah. you know, because they're they're not people are, are 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 not playing with a full deck. You know, they're missing pieces of the history um, and and missing pieces of the prophecies. And and that's why things are taken out of context. They're out of whack. And then there's all these cults come up. And what we talked about earlier about, you know, like the rapture and it's like it's it's nut making because every and now it's it's turned into like christians looking at blood moons and making predictions about the rap you're not supposed to make predictions about something that god is going to do when it's his time to do yeah. it whenever that happens and you know my my belief is that you know it happens when nibiru passes like it's like right before destruction that's when he uh, takes his people off the earth before the earth goes, flips upside down. And they say that there are, you know, people that are going to survive this. So they, you know, this, I'm sure with all of your work is, is that the, the elite have been building tunnels and going underground for decades to prepare for this. They know all about this. They know about these prophecies. And w what I found interesting was the scriptures in um, Isaiah, where it talks about that very thing, where he, he, he addresses the kings of the earth and how they go underground and they hide in caves to get away from this. And they end up, uh, he, he turns it into a prison for them, this is all Isaiah chapter 24. I, I couldn't make this stuff up. And that he turns it into a prison for them because because they think that they're doing something, you know, like independent of the creator. So it all kind of backfires on them. Um, I mean, this is all written in very clear terms in Isaiah chapter 24, if anybody wants to go read it. Um, so I find that really interesting because... Yeah. These days, there's all this stuff going on underground. Well, and and here is 24 right here. Uh, here Isaiah is. 24, yes. danger ahead. God's about to ravish the earth and leave it in ruins, rip That's everything it. out by the roots and send everyone scurrying. Priests and lay people alike, owners and workers alike, celebrities and nobodies alike, buyers and sellers alike, bankers That's and right. beggars alike. The haves and the have-nots alike. The landscape will be a monoscape totally wasted, and why? Because God said so. He's issued the orders. The earth turns gaunt and gray, the world silent and sad, sky and land lifeless, colorless. Earth polluted by its very own people. Earth is polluted by its very own people who have broken its laws, disrupted its order, violated the sacred and eternal covenant. Therefore, a curse like a cancer ravages the earth. Its people pay the price of their sacrilege. They dwindle away, dying out one by one. No more wine. No more vineyards. No more songs or singers. The laughter of castanets is gone. The shouts of celebrants gone. Laughter of fiddles gone. No more parties with toasts. Serious drinkers gag on their drinks. The chaotic cities are unlivable. Anarchy reigns. Every house is boarded up and condemned, uh, and it goes on from there uh, with, goes, yes. with with the with the joys. Um, <laughs> and, yes, it's and, and it's it's kind of a very scary prophecy. But when you when you put it together with this passage of Nibiru, it all makes sense yeah. because that's and, and and you know maybe you can pontificate about like how the Lord uses this system you know, as like a cycle to clear the earth, to create a whole new, because what comes afterwards is, 
you know, the golden age, the mm. age of Aquarius, the time of, of, of peace and brotherhood and understanding and, and peace, you know, peace on earth for a thousand, a thousand years of peace. I mean, yeah. can we even imagine that? We've never lived through something like that. Certainly not in our lifetime. I've never known peace in my lifetime. Not, not internationally. Ditto. Yeah. Ditto. I mean, so this is something to look forward to that after all this destruction and punishment and all the heavy stuff you just, you just read, something wonderful comes about, something new comes out of it all. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the hope. You know, and and people can hang their hang their hearts and their hats on that. Otherwise, we have nothing because you, you you know you can't it it can't just be all negativity, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and you know, hey, even despite what we've talked about tonight, um, it can all be negativity. You know, despite despite even knowing that this stuff will happen that a rogue planet will come that that, that uh, like until then what you know uh still do the right thing still <laughs> still take care of each other still take care of the planet you know um and and i think that's that's really the message here is that despite everything uh with the sun the craziness in society the uh, the literal um fronts put on by media and government that ultimately we're the ones in control of our optics we're we're yeah. the ones in control of how we filter the information ella that's right and and you know we have to have faith in something bigger mm. than ourselves yeah you know i mean just to kind of pair that just to you know like um to contrast Reve if you want to pull it up revelation 21 talks about the new heaven and the new earth and the old heaven and the old earth disappears. You know, the word for heaven is also the same word for skies. So when people think of heaven, I mean, you immediately think of like, oh, the stars and the planets, but it's also the skies because in Hebrew, the same word shamayim is used for both skies above the earth, you know, our atmosphere and that's going to change. So that's specifically what this prophecy talks about, how this the atmosphere around the earth changes. So all the junk and the space tech and the magnetosphere cracks and all that stuff is going to be uh, changed when the Lord returns, it says, and there's going to be a new earth. And then this piece, which is so like phantasmagorical, I mean, I don't have any other word to describe it. And and it's like a mothership. It's a city coming out of the heavens, okay, from God, it says, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And, and it has 12 gates, and each one of those gates are named after the 12 tribes, and it lands on the earth, and the whole earth is is changed and the lord sits in the middle you know whenever i read this it reminds me of i get this visual of aquaman remember the movie aquaman yeah. where when he gets the 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 trident and then he becomes the um you know the ruler of the oceans it says that the lord sits in the middle in a throne of this new city that lands on top of the earth and and rules over the whole planet with an iron rod. And I just, whenever I read that, I just get visuals of like, 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 you know, the, like the Aquaman thing where, you know, he's putting down the trident and, and all the creatures and everybody sort of like gets in place. And that's begins the thousand year reign. So that is what people have to look forward to, you know, in terms of the, you know, and, and, you know, New Agers can call it the Ascension because literally that's what's happening to the earth is that the earth, he raises it up and it becomes, you know, it just changes everything. Like the curse is removed. So and what you read, you 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 read in Isaiah 24 talks about all these curses. And this is like everything gets healed and restored. So, you know, for people out there, I just want to give them hope that it's not only limited to this lifetime exactly it's, it's what comes after this yeah and 
and and you know m- may everybody be in that good place and be you know redeemed and be uh, given that kingdom, because that's really what this whole battle is about. Like who gets the kingdom, you know, and, and it's not just about us because, you know, we're not the top, you know, about all the aliens. We're not the top of the food chain. Here. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that's just, uh, that, that's what I kept saying during the whole balloon kerfuffles is yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure we could just pop those things with a, with a missile anytime we want, you know? I'm yeah. not sure that that's exactly how that works. Um, Ella, thank you so much for your time. As always, it's always great to talk with you. We always have such fun conversations before we let you go. Let everybody Likewise, know, uh, of course, other than the curious realm website, uh, where they can find your videos and your books, let them know where they can go to keep track of everything from who's who in the cosmic zoo where they can go to get their copies of the books, uh, where they can go to keep up with your speaking schedule, all that kind of good stuff. Thank you, Chris. Um, and it's always great talking to you, too. Uh, yeah, I'm on uh, who's who in the cosmic zoo dot com. And uh, you can also find me on Amazon and Facebook. Uh, who's who in the cosmic zoo Facebook page. And um, so at my events page, I'm, I'm doing a, 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 a presentation here in Denver next month um, on cool. who, who, uh, who are the aliens and uh, how it all fits into the end time prophecies at the Denver um, paranormal research forum, which is going to be in the, in Wheat Ridge here in Colorado. So that's my next event, and um, I just uh, – it's updated all the time on my website if anyone's interested. All right. Well, once, Thank you so much. Oh, always, always a pleasure. Uh, please do hold the line while we close things out with the audience here uh, cool. for the segment. Well, of course, while you're online, folks, checking out everything from Ella LeBain, make sure to stop on by Curious Realm. That is where you can find – the store where you can get all of the books from our guests, CuriousRealm.com forward slash store is the website. Also, uh, that is where you can find our experiencer page. Uh, feel free to give us a call, 512-298-3913. If you are an experiencer of the paranormal, if you have seen or witnessed a UFO cryptid, if you are a targeted individual, um, if you're a government whistleblower, feel free to give us a call. 512-298-3913 is our listener hotline. You can leave your story there. We will share it on the show with our experts and try to get you some answers. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. As always, uh, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And remember, stay curious. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Curious Realm. Stay tuned for more guests, forbidden topics, and hidden truths. Download the official Curious Realm app and view the Knowledge Vault on our website, CuriousRealm.com. Follow us on social media by searching Curious Realm. Curious Realm is available on your favorite podcast services, as well as YouTube, Roku, Amazon Fire and Apple TV through the APR TV app, available on all app markets. Curious Realm is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great content or to become a sponsor of Curious Realm or other podcasts, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Thanks for listening. Stay curious. And remember, the other side is always watching.